Okay, hi Science 30. I'm going to finish up environmental chemistry today. Um, I'm going to talk about the last organic molecule that we need to know, esters. Um, but before that, I want to look at your D2L outline. So I'm going to give, I'm going to post a quiz in, in environmental chemistry, uh, maybe at the end of this week or early next week. So you're responsible for doing this assignment. So your organic chemistry quiz. Um, I'm going to post some smaller videos with esters. Uh, we can't do the ester lab um, because you're not in class, but I'm going to show you how to do it and then you can um, fill it out and then I'll post it. Um, there's a little uh, structure I want you to follow with understanding esterification reactions. I am going to post a video on this hydrocarbon bell ringer alone. So a bell ringer test is a visual quiz. And I'm going to post a bunch of different molecules in a video and give you the link. And then um, you can name the molecules. I'll either have them written down or made as um, a molecular model. And you have to name them. So that'll be what you're assessed on as well. This hydrocarbon chart you're also going to hand in. And it's this thing that we've been working on the last few days. So you're going to be marked on that. Okay. Uh, so... Those are your assessments for organic chemistry. Now before I talk about um, before I talk about esters and the remaining part of this unit, I want to do some quick review from yesterday. So specifically naming alcohols, we talked about halogenated hydrocarbons. Um, we talked about uh, benzene. But I want to look at alcohols again. So remember, an alcohol is anything that has OH as a functional group. And this would be your carbon one. Okay. Um, so this would be on carbon one, and that would be uh, five carbon. So that's pentan, one, all. Okay. Um, and I also want to look at carboxylic acids. So let's you let's use five carbons again. Okay, so carboxylic acids have the C double bond O O H group. So this is called a carboxyl group. And to name that, right, so you still have the pent, you still have the pentan piece. And the carboxyl group is indicated by oic acid, so it's pentanoic acid. Okay. Now in your model kit, when I post this on your bell ringer, you will always see oxygen as blue. Right, carbon will always be black and hydrogen will be white. So just be aware of that. Okay, so that's how we name carboxylic acids and how we name alcohols, right? And you can have the hydroxide group on any of these carbons in the chain. Um, and you would, name, you would name the alcohol according to where the carbon was, and they can have side branches as well. We're not going to really deal with side branches a ton um, in... Uh, science 30 however okay now the reason why I want to review these two is because esters are actually a combination of carboxylic acids and alcohols okay <clears throat> so if I look at my notes <clears throat> right esters are organic compounds formed by the chemical reaction of a carboxylic acid and an alcohol they can naturally occur or we can make them all right, so esters are the main molecules that make plastics, right? So polyesters, okay? Um, but they're also, they occur in natural flavorings and things like that. So fatty acids and fats in your bodies are stored as esters. Plastic scents, flavors, artificial or natural. Um, lots of molecules are made out of esters. Okay, so here's some ester examples. Um, you can see these different molecules are different flavors. 
that we can isolate from fruits or from uh, sugary molecules. Okay, so this is, um, you can see right, this is wintergreen flavor, methyl salicylate. So you have um, uh, an alcohol portion and a carboxylic acid portion. So this is actually salicylic acid, which is used in a lot of acne medication and methanol. Okay, so you can see a few different examples here. You can look at that in your notes. So an esterification reaction is we bring an alcohol and a carboxylic acid together. And this is called dehydration synthesis. So you have the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol, and then we treat it with a strong acid. And if we did an ester reaction in class, we would use sulfuric acid to do that. And what that does here is it removes, when it reacts with the hydrogen ion, you remove a hydroxide group and, an, and a hydrogen group. And that makes water as a product. And you get an ester. So, the, so it's a combination of two molecules. So this part of the ester reaction is the carboxylic acid. And where the single bond O is, is the alcohol. Okay? So that's, in, that's, that's a really important concept for us to understand here. So let's say we have this pentanol and this pentanoic acid that is reacted together. So let's make this. Okay, so I have um, pentanoic acid. Okay, pentanoic acid plus um, pentanol. I'm gonna put the hydroxide on the other side here. It's covered in one, two, three, four, five. And that's pentan one all. So you so you can only what it was in a serification reaction, you can only have an alcohol that has a hydroxide on the end piece here. Okay. So let's say that we reacted these two together with heat and an acid. And that is what we would do with an esterification reaction. Okay, so we're gonna react these two together with acid plus heat. Um, what we would make for products, okay, what we would make for products here is uh, water. So we would remove the Okay, so we're going to remove um, a hydrogen and a hydroxide, and we're going to make water, or HOH, okay? And then we end up with this happening. So we have Okay, so this is the carboxylic acid side. And we end up with the um, ester. So you have a double bond O and then single O as a functional group in the middle. And this is carbon one, two, three, four, five. And this is carbon one, two, three, four, five here. Okay. So this is the alcohol part. And then this is the carboxylic acid part. I'm just gonna write CA. Okay? So these are our products of an esterification reaction. Now, how we name this is we name the alcohol first and the carboxylic acid second. So the single bond O is always where the alcohol portion is. Um, and this will be now called, rather than pentanol, We'll drop the an all and we'll write pentyl. Pentyl. And rather than writing oic acid, we write O8. So pentyl. Pentanoid. Okay, pentyl pentanoid. All right. 
So we get this reaction of carboxylic acid and alcohol react with heat and hydronium or acid. We get water and an ester as a product, and that is an esterification reaction. Okay. So, that's what this talks about, naming esters. So these are all your instructions that I just went through. Okay, and this also shows this here. So esters are named by the joining of by joining the name of the alcohol with the name of the acid, right? So ethanol plus ethanoic acid would be ethyl ethanoate. Propanol is the alcohol, the ethanoic acid, and the second one is the carboxylic acid, propyl ethanoate. Okay, um, the alcohol portion is always closest to the single bond O. The carboxylic acid portion is always closest to the double bond O. So this is ethanol. And this is propanoic acid, so ethyl propanoate. This one shows propanol and methanoic acid, propyl methanoate. Okay? Methanol and one, two, three, four carbons. That's butanoic acid, that is methyl butanoate. So the so the red part is the alcohol. So you drop the OL and add YL. And then here you drop the oic acid and add OATE. So that indicates ester. Okay. Um, you can have many esters bonded together to make polyesters. Poly means many. All right. So we can synthetically bond alcohol and carboxylic acids in long chains. And this is what makes our plastic. So that is cellulose acetate. And that is a biodegradable plastic. Okay. Um, all right, so we've engineered bioplastics with that. So some of our, um, um, our eggshell or our, um, our, our, you know, our eggshell crate, um, plastics are actually biodegradable. Uh, I'll talk about this one later. Okay, so, um, I'm going to post this assignment. And you guys are going to look at your um, different, so there's eight different reactions that I would do if we were in class. We can't do those in class. So you guys are going to do a little lab activity. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do the whole thing. But this is um, condition one, two, three, or done a six. But I have two more and I handwrote them. So the seven is benzoic acid. And um, eight is uh, ethanoic acid. Now, um, this is a lab that makes artificial flavors. Okay. Um, so, in, so generally, when we do an ester lab, okay, uh, you have you'll you'll have this lab set up here, and, and so everything's in a hot water bath. And then you react the alcohol and the carboxylic acid in the test tube. This would be set up to a hot plate. And, um, and then sulfuric acid would be placed inside here. And then they would react together and they would make an ester and you'll get a scent from it. And these different things make... Um, like pineapple flavor or strawberry flavor, um, fruit punch flavor, the benzoic acid and the methanol will make wintergreen flavor. Um, this, sorry, um, this should make, uh, the benzoic acid and the methanol should make strawberry flavor, the salicylic acid and the um, ethanol, um, that will make um, wintergreen flavor. Uh, that one usually smells quite good. So unfortunately we can't do that. Um, but you can do the written portion. So what I want you to do with this lab when you hand it in is I want you to do this. So there's these eight conditions here. All right, so when I post, I'll, I'm gonna post this later on in the week. So there's these tables. I look like this. I want you to actually put the reactions of all those eight reactions um, in here. So you're going to actually map out the esterification reaction. So I'll show you the first one. 
So here's what I want you to do. So the first reaction is ethanoic acid plus octanol, and I believe this makes citrus flavor. So here's what we do. Um, I'm going to write the word equation for it. So ethanol, uh, sorry, ethanoic acid, which is vinegar, plus octan one all. Okay, so this, um, when treated with heat in H3O plus, okay, what it should do is make water, or HOH, water, and we're going to make um, ethanoic acid, right, so this is your this is carbon 1 and carbon 2, and that's going to be bonded together. That's carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, so it's going to make that molecule. Okay. So uh, my word equation will be water plus um, octyl. And then this one is ethanolate. Okay. So I want you to write out the word equation, and then I want you to write out the chemical equation. So ethanoic acid is this, plus octanol, okay, so that's H there, and then that makes um, my, uh, that's going to make my water molecule. Uh, plus that's going to make my water molecule plus my ester. So I want you to do that for all eight of those. So number two um, is ethanoic acid plus ethanol. So you would do that for making ethanol now rather than octanol. Draw your word equation out, and then make your chemical equation using line structural diagrams. You can use complete structural diagrams if you want to. I don't really care. Whatever you're comfortable with. So those predictions, I want you to make those equations. So you're practicing making esterification reactions. You're not going to be able to do the evidence, so you don't need to do that part. And the analysis you can do. So think about what would increase the yield of the ester, right? So um, things like if we had more reactants, um, if, we, um, if we had stronger acids and things like that. So think about what could increase the yield of an ester, okay? Think about how we would turn the reactions back into their original components. Now, we remove water, right, in order to make the ester, so what would we need to do in order to turn the ester back into alcohols and carboxylic acids, right? So think about that. Um, we don't have pure esters. Um, think about purification. Of, like, How do we do that, right? Uh, filtration, distillation, things like that, all right? So I want you to do a little bit of research on how you purify substances and chemical reactions. So you can do the analysis and you can do the um, prediction parts, the equations, and then the last two questions, last three questions kind of with the thought lab. And then you're going to hand that in. Um, I will post this lab tomorrow and you guys can do it at your own um, leisure. Okay. So um, let's go to your chart. So we did non nine a few days ago. I told you when I'm going to leave that one to you. Um, okay, so here's an ester. Um, this is salic silic acid. And single bond O is the alcohol part, and that's methanol. Okay, so this makes um, methyl salic silate. Okay. Methyl salic silate. 
or oil of wintergreen is the common name for this. Now let's uh, let's give the chemical formula. So the right, so I have one, two. This is a benzene ring, right? One, two, three, four, five, six carbons, seven, eight carbons. So that's C eight. Okay. Um, one, two, three, four hydrogens. Um, six hydrogens here. Plus another three hydrogens here. That's C nine. Uh, sorry, H nine. And then um, how many oxygens? I see three oxygens. Okay, so there's your line. Uh, that's your um, condensed structural diagram. Complete structural diagram. Just add the hydrogens, right? So you'd expand that out, and then expand that one out as well. So you can do that in that part right here. Your line structural diagram will look like this. It's going to look very similar. Keep the, uh, you keep the oxygens in there. You don't need to add the hydrogens or, or show where the carbons are. Um, and then remember, when you make your Lewis diagram, you're going to have to alternate the double and single bonds, right? So either two pairs of electrons or one pair of electron. Okay. Um, the next couple are, right, these are all esters. So that is an ester, and this is an ester with a line structural diagram. So let's do this one. And I'm not going to name it. I'm not going to put it all together. You can do that, but I'm going to name it. So, okay, so this, what is this? This is the alcohol side. And then this is the carboxylic acid side. So when I look at that, there's one, two carbons. So the alcohol side would be ethyl. Okay. And then here, there's one carbon. Uh, so that's ethyl methanoate. All right. And then this would be C1, 2, 3, C3. Right, so there'll be hydrogen here, hydrogen here. One, two, three, four, five. And then there's one, two, three bonds with this. So there'd be another H here. So C, so H6. And then there are uh, two oxygens. All right, ethyl methanoate. This one gives you the complete structural diagram. And again, this side is the alcohol side. And I'm not going to fill all this in either. You can do the rest. And that's the carboxylic acid side. So let's name this. So this is one, two, three, four, five carbons. So that would be pentyl. And then I have one, two, three, four carbons on the carboxylic acid side. So that's pentyl butanoate. And you can count up the carbons and hydrogens and oxygens and then get your chemical formula. And ethyl butanoate, right? Um, that would be the, the alcohol side is the ethanol and two carbons. And the carboxylic acid side is, um, uh, is butanoic acid and there's four carbons there. So you guys can, you guys can fill that one in. I'm, I think we're pretty clear with what we need to do here. Okay. So that is, so that's ester reactions, okay? That's the last organic compound that you guys need to know. Um, so the next, the last part of this unit um, addresses um, issues when persistent organic pollutants or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons get into an environment and how we manage them. So this is, um, this is a dog that's being animal tested on. Um, so we have two measurements that we use lab animals for. Right? And, uh, that seems pretty tragic here, but um, we have two um, measurements that we use in order to deal with what we can expect to have safe doses for in different environments with these um, volatile chemicals. So toxicity, um, what we're looking at, is the ability of a substance to cause damage to living tissue 
impair the function of a body tish system or cause death when ingested, inhaled, or absorbed through the skin. So when we make pesticides and herbicides and um, other types of pollutants, we have to do LD50 and LC50 testing in order to understand how it's going to act in an environment if it gets there. Um, with herbicides and pesticides, we obviously want it there. Um, so if you look at LD50, LD50 is the dosage of a chemical substance given all at once that kills half the population, tested within a specific time, expressed in milligrams per kilogram body weight. So what LD50 is, it's the lowest dose required to kill 50% of all the living things in an environment that we're trying to kill. So, which, so we use strong chemicals with low LD50 values generally because less is needed to control pests. So we want LD50 values. So these are concentrations in milligrams per kilogram of body weight. We want um, toxicity to happen at lower concentrations. So what that means is the chemicals are really strong and they can cause death with less use. All right. So if we can find really, really strong pesticides and herbicides, so if we can modify them so they have a really large toxicity value at low concentrations, that means less of it gets into the environment. And we generally want to use that because it's more economical as well. So when we're testing before something gets into an environment, we're looking at LD50. Okay. Now LC50 is, once this is exposed, what concentrations can be safe in an environment, okay? So if DDT, for example, gets into the environment, um, how much of it can the environment handle until toxicity starts to occur, right? So it's a concentration of a chemical substance in air or water that kills half the population within a specified time, and we'll express that in parts per million generally. So LD50 and LC50 values are used to determine effectiveness of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, antibiotics, drugs, household cleaners, industrial chemicals, etc. So this determines the concentrations that we deem safe with these industrial products. Um, page 284 in your text expresses the type of question that you're going to see with this. So if you look at um, question 27, 28, and 29 on page 284, um, take a look at this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at question 28. So scientists testing 2,4-D and, an, and a 2,4-D ester, so these are pesticides, compare LC50 values. Um, so it looks at uh, this in different species. So talk, right, so this... Um, this looks at um, toxicity levels, so the amounts, of, the amounts of these molecules that cause toxicity at different concentrations. So this causes toxicity in Chinook salmon, so 2,4-D, causes toxicity in Chinook salmon at 1.250 milligrams per liter, but the ester causes toxicity at 0 0.246 milligrams per liter. So this causes toxicity or harm at a much lower concentration. So what that means is, is there's way less of this required in order to damage a population. So if we're looking at a pesticide, this is a really efficient type of pesticide, but we don't want this getting into a natural ecosystem. Rainbow trout, right? If you can see with the 2,4-D, um, this caused toxicity at a lower concentration, but the ester caused um, toxicity at a much, much lower concentration than the 2,4-D, than the all right? Um, but, but toxicity happened, right, quite a bit lower uh, in the trout than, um, uh, than the Chinook salmon, regardless. All right, and then, so the, le the levels here, so this is a, a very small, these are uh, trout par, right? But uh, adult trout, um, toxicity levels are much similar. But toxicity with the ester was at a much lower concentration. So this is a much stronger pesticide, the 2,4-D ester. So this causes toxicity when it's in the environment at much lower levels. So this would be really effective for us to use to try to kill some sort of pest, but we need to have very good quality control of it so it does not get into a natural ecosystem. Okay, so um, again, 
LD50 and LC50. So LD50 is, is, is used to test prior to getting into a natural environment. LC50 is used once it, um, a molecule has gotten into an environment um, and we're maintaining testing and monitoring of it. Okay, so this, I mean, you could turn this into an ester, right? Um, so, uh, when we look at this, LD50 is short-term testing. LC50 is long-term once it's built up. Okay, so LD50 is the dose that can kill something. LC50 is what happens once it's been there for a period of time and built up. So you need to know the difference between the two of those. This, um, right, so toxicities at lower concentrations means less is needed, okay? So that's LD50 and LC50. So when we use these molecules and we put them into environments, we use, we, we, we construct them with LD50 and then monitor them with LC50, okay? And we use animal testing for that. So this is a dog that's being basically poisoned um, with a pesticide or a herbicide to see what levels of toxicity happen, right? Okay, so some issues with pest control. Um, one thing when we use pesticides is drift, so we can transfer pesticides by wind or air from locations where they weren't intended to be. Um, that can build up resistance in pests and things like that quite quickly and destroy crops. A very extreme form of this drift is called the grasshopper effect. So um, this is a really big deal for Arctic animals because they have high concentrations of fat. Now remember, these um, pesticides and herbicides, they're organic molecules, they're esters. Now fat is stored as an ester. So if these persistent organic pollutants get into an organism, they will be stored in fat. And Arctic animals and Antarctic animals have lots and lots of fat um, because they live in cold environments. So, and the grasshopper effect is really important for these types of animals. So the transport of pesticides that results from their evaporation in warmer climates and condensation and the deposit in colder climates. So it's this transfer of these pesticides and herbicides on, on global wind cells from um, agricultural regions to areas where there isn't agriculture. Right, so this is the grasshopper effect in the Arctic. Okay, so these are my slides. So this works on thermodynamics, okay? Um, and they're persistent. Remember, they don't break down. So things can really biomagnify. And then, so this is a polar bear that is uh, experiencing toxicity from pesticides in an area where there are no pesticides sprayed. Okay, so let's, let me do a little lesson with this. So when we look at the globe, if I just draw, if I draw Earth here, okay, um, here's the equator, right? Uh, law of thermodynamics tells us that um, uh, warm particles move to areas of cold part, right? Warm, warm always moves to cold, right? So the poles are cold, and the equator's warm. And everything close to the equator is also